We are the three of us on my parents' bed in my parents' room. My mom talks about the protection, about being safe. My mom says that it's beautiful, but you have to be safe. You can get sick, it can kill you. I'm confused. If it's so dangerous, why do we do it? What could feel so good that you do it even if it could kill you? I say, I'm not going to have sex, ever. Why would I if it could kill you? Why would I if it's so unsafe? Why would I have sex if protection is so important? Why risk my life? I'm laying down to remember, and my mom is looking down at me. I lean my head back to look up at her, and she's smiling Why? She says, well, it's pleasurable, and it expresses love. It's beautiful. You just have to be safe. AIDS kills. You can't catch it by sharing a coat. I couldn't say when it happened, if it happened. Which of the nights of all those nights that happened? I want to imagine it's an afternoon in the summer. We came home from walking around Soho, window shopping because we were both too poor to buy, holding hands in public, laughing about a dumb commercial we saw on TV that morning while we sat and ate the eggs and bacon and pancakes that I made above the Queen's room. We came home that afternoon, and I wanted him so bad. I had been waiting all morning to feel his chest on me. I had to pry myself out of bed those days. Leaving his body to face the day was too much to bear. We came home that Sunday afternoon in summer, and I followed him back down the hallway to his room and shut the door behind us. It startled him. He turned around. I was already on my knees. I pushed his body back onto the bed. He turned me over. We both pulled off the shorts and tank tops we had been wearing. His head moved down my body, and I was in his mouth, full. The light came in through his blinds, lines of light and dark, alternating diagonally across his beds, his sheep, his body, and mine. His bed was so much more comfortable than mine. I was on my back and in his mouth, and I looked at the light falling on his shoulders, and I felt nothing but pleasure. And I was not worried about anything, not work, not words. You couldn't hear the street noise from his room. It was quiet, rare in the city. He turned me over. I was lying on my chest, and his chest was on my back, thick with that hair, and it was hot. It was summer. And so he felt wet, and I felt wet. The air felt wet. And when a rare breeze came in through the window, it made us both shiver. I know because I could feel him shiver too. I pushed back into him and he pushed forward into me. That day we did not clean up. We fell asleep in our sweat, lines of light cutting our bodies diagonally until it was time to make dinner. If it happened, that's the day that I choose. I am writing the end twice, because neither is the end. Both ends are true. They are my story and ours. The month he was gone smelled like honeysuckle and tasted like gin. I felt free from his moods, his expectations. I felt free of our sex, which had become all-encompassing, unsustainable. I had been putting off my yearly checkup for three months. I was afraid that I could not st step back into a free clinic. But I was nervous about the phone call from my doctor, a life changed, not death anymore, just a new and careful life, an excuse for therapy, a longing still for sustainable connection. I asked him to use a condom after the last time I found him online. It was a break between us, a rupture. It hurt him. We didn't fuck that afternoon. We talked and talked, made truth, broke it, and made it again. Kissed slow and deep, and walked out to get dinner. It was blowjobs and jerking off for a while. Blowjobs and jerking off were hot, but we wanted to fuck it and complain us we used condoms. He told me he had no more profiles online. Work took him to Prague for a month. I bought him from the lab. He would say that I cheated too, and he would not be lying. He found messages, Facebook, emails, texts, messages from ex, exes, messages from boys, tender and emotional messages. He was never tender or emotional with any of the boys he was talking to, that much I do believe. But I was often longing for something more, and when I was hurt, which was often, I would run to someplace safe to a boy who wanted me. 
he found out, and my infidelities gave him permission to feel safe in his world of grinder, of boys ever wanting him, wanting him so badly, begging him for it, just once, looking for now. His infidelities gave me permission to feel safe in my world of boys, boys who wanted me for my heart, for my brain, boys who wanted to be with me, who would ensure that I would not be alone, not forever. The doctor came and went. The waiting in my life with health insurance and primary care physicians was done at a respectful distance. I waited for a phone call. There was no waiting room, no posters speaking worst case scenarios into being. I was biking on my way to lab when I was released. I had played this game before. I knew who would be calling me from an unlisted number three days after my appointment. I pulled over to listen to the message. I was standing one foot on the sidewalk and one on my bike the morning rush hour traffic floating past my right shoulder as I listened to the message. Negative. Or was the word she used normal? I was standing in the shadow of the New York Public Library, expansive, bricks and marble, stairs and gardens on 42nd Street and 5th Avenue, with one foot on the sidewalk and one foot on my bike, traffic so close behind that I could feel air rush after car after car after car. When I was released, when I got free. I'm writing the end twice. Both ends are true. They are my story and ours. The second time I tested positive for HIV, he was in Prague for work. The month he was gone smelled like honeysuckle and tasted like gin. I felt free from his moods, his expectations. It was spring. Summer was on the horizon, showing herself, but only sometimes, always unpredictable, and I chased her. I biked home from lab through Central Park, and when it had rained during the day or night, the honeysuckle ordered on overwhelming, cloyingly sweet, too much of a good thing. When I first moved to New York, HIV was a fear that was present in my mind, but not in my life. Not that I knew of anyway. I knew positive people, but to my knowledge, it was no one close to me. These were people who seemed to fit too neatly into a 1990s HIV narrative. They were older, gay men who had somehow and miraculously survived the plague, who had become infected before we knew any better. That is not our story anymore, if it ever was. We are a generation of people who grew up knowing too much and tried to run from this knowledge. It is now our turn to make mistakes, to regret them, to love recklessly and without guilt, to be safe as safe as we can. I got the call on my way to work, biking down Fifth Avenue. I knew right away. They do not ask you to come back in for a consult if everything is fine. In a flash, my life changed. This time, my hands did not shake. I was outside under the city sky and skyscrapers, with city smells and humidity pushing down on me. I have to say this. It is not my fault it is not his. Forgiveness is not mine to give or seek. It is not a death sentence. It is a call to life. It is not isolation. It is a call to connect. It is not disease. It is a call to care. I am not full of hate. I breathe in our love. It is not stigma. It's community. We are the vanguard. We refuse to budge. This is the battle. This is the war. We will live. We will love, we will fuck, dark and dirty, safe but always dangerous, with the greatest <coughs> care and pleasure, sharing our bodies and spirits, sharing the best and worst of ourselves. Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Thank you so much. <coughs>